Well, that was that was fantastic. All those songs um, and everything in it. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take a second here to call call something out. If you look if you look around now, I know I know we're shorter in number today because of the weather, uh, which is okay because we've been shorter in number because of the virus for a long time. So we understand that. But if you look around, um, if you haven't heard it or seen it or noticed it, there's a lot of kids here. We got just as many young ones you know, per capita, uh, as we do the older ones, which means that we're doing our job Amen. as Christians and as a church. And, uh, and I'm not, I, I don't, I don't know about anybody else, but I am 110% not bothered by the sounds that they make because to me, they're, they're joyous. They're beautiful. We got sweet Milo who, who made her crayon mess, which is awesome. And we got my little ones that are back there that are screaming and all. And I hear mom. I can hear her. Shh, 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 you know, I hear that. And then we've got little Ava standing. And we got Jackson dancing while we're singing. That's what church is. That's what worship is. There was a time. So I brought you up. I'm going to bring you back down. There was a time. And we'll talk about it a little bit. Where uh, in, in, throughout the church's history, there's been times of ups and downs. And some goods and some bads, and there was there's a there was a time in the 1500s or so when they were trying to write the the Bible in, in our in, instead of Latin, so the priests were the only ones who could read it. That they were writing it in um, um, English, and these men were were persecuted, arrested, and killed. But even more than that, there were parents. There were there are stories of parents who were arrested and killed for teaching their children how to pray. And so we don't have that right now. Out of all of the restrictions and guidelines that we've been given. Right now, the country is divided between wear a mask or don't wear a mask. That's what we're divided by right now, is whether or not we should or whether or not we should. That's not nearly as bad as you're going to be burned at the stake for teaching your child the Lord's Prayer. So let's praise God in the fact that right now, no matter how bad it is, what news station we watch, what party we um, you know, vote to, whatever, out of all of that, we can still teach our children how to pray to Jesus Christ, who is the mediator between us and God directly. That we don't have to go through a priest. That we don't have to go to the church to receive a blessing. That we do that in our pews, in our homes, in our cars, in our beds. That we have Jesus because of his blood, because of his sacrifice directly to us. That's, that's a praise. And that we can teach our children to pray and know him so that we can have a Jesus club. Amen. So we have children that want to do those things, that want to be here. That's a, that's a praise. Um, I'll say that, and, and I'm, I'd like to read the scripture that we're going to study this morning, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. So if you would, turn with me uh, to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25 is what I'm going to read. 1 Peter chapter 1. I don't know for sure because God's in charge of everything, but I, I, I think we might stay in 1 Peter for a little while and go maybe go through the whole book. I don't know. Uh, but last, last week we did 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. So I want to pick up on where we left off there. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And Peter writes, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. 
since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. If you would, go with me to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, by which we are saved. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us here to study, to share in your word together as, as believers of like mind and, and like heart. We pray for the souls of everyone here. We pray for the lost, for those that are outside of here, for those who couldn't attend for the weather, those who can't attend because of sickness. We pray for all those who, who know you but have turned away. We pray for all of those who have never known you, that your spirit works on them through us and that they can find salvation through you before it's everlasting too late. We pray that you be with this service this morning, that you give me the words to speak and uh, courage and boldness for this church. We pray for your spirit, for your presence. We pray that we learn something here and that it encourages us, uh, refuels us, re-energizes us, and, um, and that we can take it and use it in our everyday walk of life, and that we can use it not only for ourselves, but for those around us. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. So let's, let's start in verse 1. There's something, there's something about verse 1 that it's, it, I can't help myself. I can't help it. I'm still a child. I, I tell everybody, I really did. I peaked. I peaked in eighth grade. In eighth grade, that's, that was it. I became an adult as I grew up, but I've always had that eighth grade mindset. So when I read, gird up your loins, there's something in me that wants to chuckle. You know, like, ha, 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 that's, that's funny, right? If you don't know what that means, and I didn't because I've heard that before. It's a very old, um, ancient, you know what I mean? This is 2,000 years old. It's a very old um, saying for something that we say today. We say the same exact thing. When we say, I'm going to have to roll up my sleeves, we know what that means. We know when we say, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves on this one, we know we're going to have to do some work. We're going to have to get sweaty, get muddy, put some effort into it. We're going to have to work hard. When they would, because they wore different clothes then, they wore, they wore what we call tunics. Um, and if you've ever seen pictures or movies with a Roman soldier where they, they never wore pants. They always had these, these dressy type things on. There's a reason for that. They could move freely. And in the deserts, it's very, very hot. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but one of the things that, they were, that the army would do, that they would teach us to do, is we would wear our sleeves when we were in the desert. We would wear our sleeves down. You would never wear short sleeves, you know, because you'd sunburn. You'd burn bad. But you'd wear your sleeves down and you'd roll, roll the, back, the other part up because that, that allows it to breathe. That allows some wind to get in there. And it'd be very loose. And you do the same thing with your boots. Because most of the time in the Army, the Marines, the Navy, you blouse your boots. You tuck your pants down into your legs because that, that keeps it from whatever. But in the desert, they'd have you untuck them and roll them up two or three times so that it would breathe. So that's, how, that's why they wore the things that they wore. And what they would do before going into battle or going to work, to really go to work, they would take their garments. And I'll, I'll show you. They would, they would take their garments and they would pull them up, tie them up, and they would have these belts, you know, whatever, and they would gird up their loins. That's what they would do so that they could stretch out, move more freely, and swiftly. There's nothing that another soldier could grab onto that's dangling, you know. When Peter here begins by saying, gird up your loins, he starts with a very alarming word. He starts with, therefore. And whenever you see therefore, what is, what is the old saying? Whenever you see it, you've got you to ask, what's it there for? There's therefore, what's it there for? Everything that Peter wrote from verses 1 to 12 led up to this. This is the point that Peter is making in verses 1 to 12. He says, because I said all of that to tell you, therefore... All of these things, gird up your loins, roll up your sleeves, get ready to work. And so what did he say in, uh, in verses 1 through 12 that was, that was so important? 
Well, he told us about our faith. Last week we talked about, um, specifically in verse 7, says that the genuineness of your faith being much more pre precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may it be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Two times he mentions that. He says it here in verse 7 about uh, being more precious than gold. And he says it again um, down here in verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. Our inheritance with Jesus Christ, the revelation that is Jesus Christ, is not something that anyone can ever take away from us. It's not something that will perish. It's not something that will go away. And that's extremely important, and Peter is trying to get that across. There are two things he tells us in these first few verses that we need to have as Christians. And we are in a constant battle against the two. It's love and obedience. He says, gird up your loins. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully on the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. When, when you hear the word holiness, that's a, that's a word that we use in the church that maybe not doesn't mean what it used to mean as much, and, and outside the church, it's not as good a word. There were times in the church's history where everyone was focused on holiness, and you would be burned at the stake for being a heretic because you weren't living a holy enough life or you were preaching or teaching or talking about something different. There are other times in the church where love is the focus. It's all about love. We might consider ourselves in an age of love right now because it's much more about what Jesus did for us than how we live. We talk about um, many times Jesus' great love for us and how it helps us live a better life. What we don't talk about is how we're not supposed to sin. And when we do sin, we should ask forgiveness for it and try to change and be transformed. What Peter's trying to tell us here is that it's not one or the other, but it's both. And while they're in a constant battle with one another, some of us may struggle more with one than the other. Some of us may love unconditionally with no problems whatsoever and not be judgmental. And that is not the area I need to work on. But I'm not so obedient. Some of us may be the exact opposite, where we're not very caring to other people, um, not as much as maybe we could be, but that's okay. That's my nature, but I'm very obedient. I follow the rules, and I'm at church when the doors are open, and I give what I'm supposed to give, and I do this, and I support, and I do that. I'm very obedient, but maybe not so much out of love. And what it's supposed to be is, is a, a joining of the two. It should be obedience because of love. It should be love because of obedience. And out of that, we should have a hope. But a hope, a hope for what? And that's, that's kind of the key for, for this, morning's, uh, this morning's message. If, what would it be like, and I, I'm, gonna, I, I don't, I don't wanna, I'm probably not going to blow anybody's mind, but when I had this thought, it blew mine. It's not hard to blow my mind. It's not. Uh, I'm very easy. I'm <laughs> very easy. Uh, but I, I started thinking, it's never occurred to me, not one time, what if, what if God changes his mind? That's never occurred to me, not once since I became a Christian. What if he changes his mind? Because, because in the foundation that I had, that I found when I found Jesus Christ was that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and true, and holy, and he, he doesn't change his mind. Well, the children, they, they asked, you know, one of them asked me, you know, what if? And then I, and I, and then I read this, and it tells us in verse 20, he indeed who foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. He tells us in verse um, 13, upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We believe in the one who was foreordained before everything. That the revelation that is to come is Jesus Christ. There's, there's, really, there's three hopes. There's the hope um, that God had in the beginning and we failed. There's the hope that we live in today. And then there's the hope that we have in the future. 
that when Jesus comes, whether it's whether it happens when Jesus comes or I go to him, the hope that we have is that what has been promised is guaranteed. It's not something that I have to hope um, my car starts. I have to have faith that my friends are making the right decision. I, it's not that kind of wavering. It is a hope that when the revelation of Jesus Christ happens in these last days, that it is true what he has told me. I have an inheritance. We have an inheritance in heaven that cannot and will not fall away. This is the hope. This is a living hope, and it is active because it's still in progress. We live every single day with that hope, with that light at the end of the tunnel, seeking the promise. That's why those, those songs that we sing, that we'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. It doesn't matter what they do to us or tell us to do in this life. The church is full of history that shows us people who truly believed that they would be rewarded after death if they died for Jesus Christ. That you can't tell me what I can and cannot believe. I am who I am. I am a Christian. I believe. And I will not say that I don't believe because I would rather you hurt me now than me never be in God's presence because of it. I'm not that weak. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. That's what Jesus said. Uh, a couple of things about church history. Um, if you know anything about Nero, Nero was crazy. And he, he began, uh, it had already started in the communities for many reasons, but he began a mass persecution of the Christians uh, in Rome and, and outskirts of Rome. And he burned Rome, or they think he burned Rome, and he blamed it on the Christians. And there were lots and lots of martyrs around Nero's day. And then I talked about him last Wednesday. After Nero came a man named Diocletian, and uh, Emperor Diocletian made it his mission to extinguish Christianity. This is around three, two, 250 AD or 300 ish, you know, whatever. I'm not a historian. Um, and he was, so, he, he was so big on himself that he made monuments. They found two, there could have been more, and he stamped it on coins, even, Roman coins that said Diocletian, Augustine, Caesar, Augustus, Maximus. You know, he was real big on himself. Um, uh, having extinguished the superstition of Christ, having stamped out Christianity, you know. It says at the end of this, at the end of this, Peter quotes Isaiah when he says, All flesh is as grass, and all glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This was written around the time of Nero. Before Diocletian. Nero and Diocletian killed many, many, many people, including Peter and Paul. Um, and some church tradition even tells us that Peter's wife was martyred um, shortly before Peter. And Peter prayed, was able to pray for her. Um, after Diocletian, we get a man, and you'll recognize his name, maybe, Emperor Constantine. Does anybody know? Uh, it's more of a Bible study now. Anybody know why Constantine's important for the church? It was Emperor Constantine who uh, accepted Christianity as the religion of Rome. The reason the Roman Catholic Church began is because Constantine decided 25 years after Diocletian, 25 years after Diocletian, and he tried to extinguish Christianity, Constantine said, we can't extinguish it. The more we kill, the more show up. And there is a Catholic story, I don't know how true this is, but there is a Catholic story um, that says Diocletian actually had a revelation or a vision or a dream and he came to faith in, in Christ. I don't know that that's true. I've never even presumed to judge a person, let alone a person that I've never in a million years had a chance to meet. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what's true about that. What I do know is they were persecuting Christians and Diocletian thought that he had stamped them out. 25 years later, it was the national religion. The word of the Lord endures forever. God is at work in that. After Diocletian and, and Constantine and the Catholic Church, we know what happened. We, we have the early centuries and then the Dark Ages and then the Catholic Church persecuted people who didn't believe, didn't believe in the Catholic, whatever, whatever. And then we have the Protestant Reformation. We have the settlement of the United States. We have the First Awakening, the Second Awakening. And then we have where we are here. And what we have is God's Word. 
Peter wrote this before this was ever written. Peter's letter is a part of a bigger book, a bigger work that has endured forever and will endure forever. And the way that it will endure forever is God's providence. God makes that happen. In verse 1, or I'm sorry, in verse 13, after he says, Therefore, gird up your loins, gird up the loins of your mind. Roll up the sleeves of your mind. Get your mind right. Be sober. Webster defines soberness uh, as to make or become more serious, sensible, and solemn. In the military, um, especially in combat arms jobs, they have, a, they have a saying for those that are in the woods and in the fight. It's stay alert, stay alive. Now, Amanda will tell you uh, that I am probably the least alert person she has ever met. I have zero situational awareness. I just, I, I trip, I fall, I stumble, I'm clumsy, I don't see what's going on. She had an electrical thing happen this morning where the, her hair thing kind of popped. And it took me, I like, I, I have moo cow reflexes. It took me a few seconds to go, what was that? You know, but she moved on, you know. And I, I don't know why that is. But what God is telling us through Peter is that we need to be solemn, sensible, reasonable, and serious. We have to have a, a laughter and a happiness and a joy. He tells us to be joyous in what we have, but we have to know that our faith and our calling in that faith is to be serious. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to remember to be sober in that fact. That it is, it's okay Perfectly okay to be happy that we're blessed, happy that we're saved. I am extremely happy knowing that I'm going to go to heaven. That's just me. I'm happy to know, I pray that every, everyone here is there with me and that we can all be in that together. But I'm also solemn and sad and serious in the fact that there are people out there that don't know. And that somehow, some way, we, we've got to get them here to get there. Because the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. He says that. He says that. And there, there are so many other churches. Not just not church, but so many other things too. The world wants us to change and adapt this archaic way of believing. You know, they need to, they need to, this was written at a time when this wasn't allowed and that wasn't allowed. But it's acceptable now. Because it's acceptable in society, you need to rethink and reinterpret. And there, there are Christian Christian movements that ought to be interpreting these things. What Jesus says is that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If he says that, everything else that he says has to be true too, if that's true. If not, then he was either crazy or a liar. And I don't believe my God was crazy or a liar. And I'll go, I'll go to jail. I'll go to death if I have to for that because I truly believe it. And I, I believe it so much that I want my children and my children's children and everybody who ever sees us to know we believe it that much. That doesn't make us crazy. This isn't Jonestown. We're not a cult. But we believe that there's an inheritance, a reward for us there that nothing here can ever match up to. No dollar, no gold, no silver, no house, no amount of pain that they could inflict on us here can outweigh that. And that's, that's how we are supposed to live, with that soberness, with our minds girded up and in, in, in ready for battle, ready, staying alert and staying alive and being mindful of what we see other people doing and what we see on TV. I see a movie, you know, that, and by the way, and I'll, I'll end on this, uh, PG, PG uh, in 1995, does not mean the same thing that PG in 2020 means. Because you turn on a 1995 movie, they're like, I remember watching that when I was a kid, and turn on for the kids, and my goodness, 
I'm like, I do not remember that. You know, they said this and did this and did that. Anytime you see something that they shouldn't see, what do you do? You turn it off. We should do the same thing. When we're around things that we shouldn't be around, we exclude ourselves. Or use that opportunity to say, you know, I'm just saying, this probably isn't a good thing for you to be seeing. Not a good thing to you, for you to be partaking in. I'm not calling out your sin, but I'm calling out your sin. You know what I mean? In a loving way. And we need to make sure that we're that way, that we don't get clouded. Because our minds can get clouded. Um, and we are, we are susceptible to sin. He tells us that throughout. But what we're supposed to do, um, in times like this, especially right now with the coronavirus and everybody looking for what's the right answer, like I say, we're divided on should we, well, there's, there's lots of different divides. Should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? Should we send our kids to school? Should we homeschool? It, we, there's divides. What the world might say in a situation like this is where is God in all of this? And what they should see is God in us. Jesus through us. And when people look around and they see us taking the opportunity to light the way, not because we have all the right answers, but to say we're going to do this out of love. We're going to do this out of obedience for what the word says. We're going to do this because of our faith, because of what we truly, truly believe. We are called to walk forward in obedience with our heads high in hope, eyes on our Savior, anxiously awaiting his return. Whether he comes to us or we go to him first. It's very likely that I'm going to go to him first. I'm perfectly okay with that. Perfectly okay. I don't want to go right now. I'd love to be around for my kids to have kids and their kids to have kids. I'd love that. But whenever it is that he calls us home, we're content and we're ready to be there, we're not, we're not waiting for the last minute. There should be no um, bedside, bedside salvation here. And we need to help the world get there. That they believe in him the way that we believe in him because of his love. What is it? The Bible tells us we love him because he first loved us. I pray that everyone here has that kind of love and you have that assurance and that hope that that revelation will come to fruition someday Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And there will be a day of judgment whether or not. And what side do you want to be on on that day of judgment? And I said this. It was told to me when I first became a Christian in a, uh, in a, uh, it was a philosophy of religion class at Madisonville Community College. Uh, he, at the end of the class, the very end, he said, at the beginning of the class, he said, I'm not going to try to preach to you. I'm going to teach you because he was a professor. This is a college. But at the end of the class, he said, I'm going to put it to you like this. I'm not telling you to get saved. I can't do that as a professor. But after all this is over, the one thing you should know is either the Christians are wrong and it doesn't matter because they're still living their lives and they're going to die and be the same situation that you are. Or they're right. And if they're right, where's that put you? There's only there's a, there's no in between. You can't be halfway right, halfway wrong. So and that that was one of the things that led me to say, where do I want? You know, where do I want to be in that? So I'll leave you with that. I hope I hope that if there's any doubt in your mind about Jesus, that you you pray, you study, you talk with somebody, and you clear that up because Jesus is real. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So if we if if we can have a song of invitation, please.